In fact, in 2006, you may recall that in the United States Senate, the Senate considered a bill, Hagel-Martinez, unfortunately named after two Republican senators, Senator Hagel of Nebraska, Senator Martinez of Florida. They passed amnesty in the Senate. There was legislation that was passed in the Senate in 2006 to grant millions of illegal aliens in this country amnesty, legal status. Um, it was to be considered in the House of Representatives. And once again, unfortunately, uh, President George W. Bush wanted to sign am an amnesty for millions of illegal aliens, uh, but it had to come through the House of Representatives in order to, be, in order to reach his desk. Well, uh, I was chairman of the Subcommittee on Immigration, Border Security, and Claims, as I mentioned. It was the committee of jurisdiction, subcommittee of jurisdiction, which would have, under regular order, considered this immigration bill, this amnesty. Um, and it would have come after the subcommittee, it would have gone to the full committee on the judiciary, on which I said, on which Chairman Sensenbrenner was the chairman at that time, Chairman Jim Sensenbrenner of, of Wisconsin. Well, the House leadership came to us on several occasions, and, uh, and we, we discussed contemplation of uh, amnesty legislation. And uh, I let it be known to our leadership that uh, I would speak against legislation in subcommittee, I would vote against legislation in my own subcommittee as chairman, and I would uh, rail against legislation outside of Congress if we were to consider it. And the chairman of the full committee was similarly opposed to to uh, amnesty, and so we, we let leadership know that we would speak against it and likely vote against it. Uh, I mean, I would vote against it. The chairman was, uh, uh, was very opposed to it. I won't speak for him tonight, but uh, I would uh, speak against it. I would vote against it, and I would speak against it out in public uh, on Lou Dobbs or whoever else wanted to talk about, about amnesty. And then if it came to the floor from the full committee, then I would speak against it, vote against it, and, and uh, rail against it outside. Well, it was never considered in the House of Representatives. Amnesty was never, although it passed in the Senate, it, did not, it was not ever considered in the House of Representatives because it would have had to go on outside of regular order uh, in order for it to be, to have favorable consideration in some venue, in some forum, and the leadership ultimately decided they didn't want the chairman of the subcommittee and the chairman of the full committee to be speaking against and voting against their own legislation. So we stopped it. But we, we need to stop it in the United States Senate. Uh, we, we, need, we need a voice, more than one voice, in the United States Senate uh, to, to stop it there so that we don't have to worry about what happens in the House of Representatives. That's why, uh, if I can just say as an aside here, friends, that's why this election in Indiana is so vitally important. Uh, uh, speaking of Dick Morris, once again, has, has looked at these, uh, looked at the, the uh, races that are going to be uh, considered in, in the fall, the, the, the uh, uh, different seats that are going to be up, and he said, you know, it's likely that it's going to be pretty easy for the Republicans to get to 49 uh, seats. But in order for them to get to 50, uh, in, in order for them to get to 51, they're going to have to win Indiana and California. Because if they don't win both of them, then that means there's a tie in the Senate, and you know who will break that tie? <laughs> Vice President Biden. So, so Indiana is on everybody's radar screen. Everybody, Indiana is either the 50th or 51st seat. Even if we get to 50, and even if we have to make Joe Biden come into the Senate every single day to pass anything, which I wouldn't necessarily be looking forward to, to that, but, but, but for, for the sheer purpose of ideology and the process, if we made him come into the Senate every single day just to pass the next bad thing that the Democrats were gonna pass, then, then that, would be, that would be helpful. So, so we're, going to, uh, we're going to be working, I'm going to be working uh, to make sure that that's a reality in May, that's a reality in November, and then in January, uh, we give uh, Joe Biden something to do every day. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> so we, we've talked about health care, we've talked about cap and trade, we've talked a little bit about immigration. Big ticket items that can cost our economy 
hundreds of billions of dollars, if not trillions of dollars, with regard to their cost directly to the government and their cost to the economy and the jobs that will be, that will be lost and the revenue to the federal government that will be lost. Not that I'm, not that I'm a, a big proponent of large, large portions of revenue going to the federal government, but that brings us to the, the fourth and probably the most daunting task that's before us and most troubling uh, aspect of what government is doing today. In 1994, when I ran for Congress for the first time, there were several issues. It, 2010 is looking very similar to, to 1994. Back then it was Hillary Care. Now we're talking about Obamacare. Uh, back then we were uh, coming off of a war in one front, namely Somalia, heading potentially to a war in a second front, Bosnia-Herzegovina. Now we're talking about Afghanistan and Iraq. And at that time, uh, I was on the stump uh, just railing against a record deficit of over $240 billion. <laughs> record deficit, two, almost a quarter of a trillion dollars. Oh, for the good old days, am I, am I right? But that's, and, and somebody said chump change. We are now in the midst of a $1.6 trillion annual deficit. And it, the numbers keep going up. We don't want to hear from the Congressional Budget Office again, because it originally started off at something like $900 billion, which is obviously too much, and then it went to $1.3, and then it went to $1.5, and the most recent estimate is that we will run up $1.6 trillion of red ink this year. Now, friends, we can't continue to do this. We cannot continue to do this. This is going to end one of two ways. This is going to end with Americans coming together just like this. And you can't, you can't believe how encouraged I am. I know some folks gave up some, some meetings. I think the Freedom Makers had a nightly Constitution class. Is that right? And you, and you postponed that to come here to listen to a politician? I, but, but, uh, and, and so you can't, you can't believe how encouraged I am that you are willing to take time out of your very busy schedules with your businesses, your families, your uh, uh, everything that you're doing to come here and voice concern by, if nothing else, your presence. And we are only going to do this as a country, as a people. We must resolve that we are not going to make the next generation, our children and their children, slaves to our nation's creditors.